Surprisingly, Daniel and the magistrate were already at the courthouse. She ate ham, eggs, toast and tea, while Susan went about the chores in the kitchen and the parlour. Mrs. O'Reilly kept her company, telling her the latest news of St. John's. A fire relief committee had been established to distribute food and clothes and to begin to find employment for the many who were lost, lost their livelihoods to the inferno. So that was the Great Fire of 1892. Foreign aid was already arriving from Halifax and Boston, and these were, were true things that Boston and Halifax did come to the aid of uh, St. John's in Newfoundland. She also chatted about placentia. Mary was surprised at the numbers of people who came through on vessels bound for the Grand Banks in the United States. The boats brought trade, but they also brought trouble. I'm worried about you, Miss Rourke, Mrs. O'Reilly said. Mary, please. Why? I already had a discussion with Mr. Cooper this morning regarding your voyage. I really don't think you should go dressed like that. Mary looked down at her worn dress and guessed that maybe it wasn't good enough to travel. It's all I have, she said, embarrassed that it was pointed out. This and a couple of more, I'm sure when I get to Boston my sisters will help outfit me. Mary, you don't understand. I don't mean your apparel. I mean you shouldn't wear a dress on the boat. There are a lot of men on those ships, some of questionable character. And to have a girl parading around wouldn't be good. Really, I'm sure other women have traveled on the boats. Yes, they have. Some are women who are not of the most upright of society. But rarely do women travel unaccompanied by husbands or fathers. And especially on a freight ship. But why is that a problem, Mary asked. Mary, my dear, you are an innocent as Daniel mentioned. She said in a concerned tone, not all men are good and kind like the young man you're traveling with. Some of them are more like that oaf that you brought to jail. You need to be careful and keep to your room for the four or five days on the water. I'm sure the captain will be as protective as he can. However, neither he nor Mr. Cooper can be with you all the time. Mrs. O'Reilly went on to explain how the freight boats were nothing like the passenger liners that would typically port in St. John's. The freighters were not set up for leisure travel associated with, with the liners, but were bare necessities for working men. Additionally, some of the crewmen were people who were picked up in different ports. They could be trying to escape from the law from some reason or another. Some were harmless and were known to carouse with women of loose morals at the bars. Who knew what could happen if a bunch of men were drinking on the ship? Let's just say it's not the best place for a young lady. All right, Mary said. I'm sure you know what's best. I think you should consider wearing pants on your boat, ride, and keep your hair covered with a hat, she continued. That way, you won't stick out so much. Pants me? I know, dear. I'll have Susan dig out a few pairs of William Jr.'s trousers. He has long grown out of them. There's not much need of them since the children have gone, Mrs. O'Reilly said. I've been meaning to give them to the church, but haven't got around to it. We'll fit you out this afternoon, and by the time William and Dan will get back from court, they won't recognize you. Mary couldn't fathom how she could go along with this concept. It was so foreign to her. But after a bit of urging and convincing from Mrs. O'Reilly, she agreed to at least try on the condition that she would help Susan find the clothing. With breakfast cleared away, she accompanied Susan to the attic and searched through several trunks before finding what they were looking for. A short time later, Mary was standing in a pair of woolen pants while Susan and Mrs. O'Reilly loosely pinned the garment so it wouldn't fall off and wouldn't show her curves. Mary insisted that she be the one doing the sewing, 
The young girl brought a needle and thread, and Mary sat by the window and began to work. With speed and efficiency, she began to needle work on the second pair of brown covered work pants. She tried on a pair, the pant legs scratchy on her own. Mary felt odd not being in a dress. To top it off, she threw on one of several loose-fitting plaid flannel shirts. To keep her pants in place, she found a small leather belt, boring some extra holes to make it fit. Mrs. O'Reilly fetched a plain woolen cap for her head. Mary braided her hair. She pinned it up, sticking the stray pieces beneath the brim. Mrs. O'Reilly and Susan both applauded the final ensemble. You look great, like a young boy, Mrs. O'Reilly said. Are you sure I should be wearing this, she asked. She dumped, jumped when Daniel spoke behind her. Yes, young lad, we're sure you should be wearing this. Thank you, Mrs. O'Reilly. This is perfect, Daniel said, tossing her cap as he passed. Mary looked at him. So you think it's a good idea? Am I too much trouble? She asked as an afterthought. Of course you're not too much trouble, he said. And yes, it's a good idea. We're leaving tomorrow with a crew of 20, and I don't know any of them. The judge can vouch for the captain, but even the captain can keep an eye on his crew at all times. So we're going tomorrow. What if Pierce, she asked. As suspected, he's been ordered deported and will go to Boston with us on the Newfoundland. And from there, we'll be transported to New York for trial. The magistrate has booked passage for all three of us on the ship, Daniel said. Two extra crew will be hired to guard the prisoner. Pierce will be locked in a cabin until we reach port in Boston. You and I... You and I'll each have a secure compartment, since I'll be traveling with a large amount of money, and you're obviously a female, although not so obvious anymore. Once we get to Boston and you see your sisters, I'll take Pierce to New York, return the money, and I'll be back in Boston in time to figure out college. Magistrate O'Reilly piped in, you must use extreme caution. Word has gotten out since court that Daniel is carrying a lot of money. Because you're leaving on the morning tide, we may avoid trouble, but there is no accounting for what could happen on that boat. Be careful and keep your eyes open. Daniel nodded, fully understanding the th threat and intending to have his pistol on him at all times. He would keep watch over Mary, and he was willing to give his life to protect her. Disguising her was a smart move. The magistrate also gave him an undersized revolver for Mary. She had been, this had been confiscated from a rum runner out of St. Pierre and was small enough for her to conceal in her clothing. After supper, they retired early, preparing for pre-dawn rise. Mary and Daniel thanked the couple for being so good to them. Susan packed several dried meats and fruits for the trip. Mrs. O'Reilly gave Mary several books, and Mary was content to read for the four days on the water. She would make herself as invisible as possible. Though, though this whole experience, or through this whole experience, she knew to, was new to her, she would do as Daniel had asked. Still, tentacles of doubt continued to seep into her conscience. She should be tending gardens and getting ready for work in the cannery, not having such foolish notions that put her in a strange, unknown world. She shook her head to calm her misgivings, but unfortunately they lingered. She still had to look after herself like she did at home, the difference being her surroundings, one familiar, one unreal and foreign. The only piece that tied it together was Daniel, and the fate she placed in his protection. Sleep was elusive and, and fleeting. So Mary is going to Boston. The next morning, she dressed in her pants and shirt before Susan came to call her. 
Mrs. O'Reilly had a dark grey coat ready. It was lined with what looked like sheep's wool. Dan'l mentioned it would be cold on the water, so she would do well to take it, and it would further disguise her appearance. As they carefully walked to the wharf in the semi-darkness, Mary saw the outline of the massive boat in the distance. It had the mast in front and the mast in the back, and a house as big as hers in John's Pond in the centre of the deck, with a tall metal stack coming out in the middle. Both nervous and petrified, she resisted the urge to grab onto Daniel's hand. She took a deep breath, partially quelling those feelings, and found instead the courage and strength she needed to stay the course towards the dock. They spotted two policemen ahead of them on the wharf with Pierce, so Daniel and Mary held back until he was transported by Dory to the ship and secured below. They could hear his oaths and threats in the stillness of the morning air as several crewmen took charge of him and pushed him below deck. The Dory returned for them. Daniel shook hands with the captain, who then extended his hand to hers. Mary clasped it hard and firm to give herself a false sense of bravado. He was surprisingly well-dressed and cleanly shaven. The captain hesitated before letting go of her hand and said, I'm Captain John Ferguson. I understand you'll be traveling with the prisoner and we'll be in charge of him once we make it port in Boston. I'm Daniel Cooper and this is Martin Rourke. And yes, we'll be accompanying the prisoner. I understand you have two cabins for us and that the magistrate has been in contact with you regarding payment. Mary kept her head down and didn't make eye contact. He regarded her for a moment and then nodded. Welcome aboard, Mr. Cooper and uh, Mr. Rourke, he said. He was well aware that Mary was not Martin, but seemed willing to go along with their choice. In some ways, it made it much easier for him to keep his crew in line for the voyage. I'll personally escort you to your accommodations. I've informed my crew that your guests of mine and to interfere with either of you will be akin to interfering with me. I do not foresee trouble on this trip. He led them through the boathouse and below deck. Their rooms were side by side beneath the stairwell each with its own key, which were already in the locks. I have the only other key to your rooms, and will safeguard them on my person at all times. Nonetheless, you'll be wise to stay below deck, Miss Fork, he said quietly. I'm willing to go along with your scheme to ensure we have the least amount of complications possible. If you need anything, have Mr. Cooper bring it to my attention. I will, Mary said and thanked him for his understanding. She removed the key from the keyhole. With her small canvas bag and the package provided by the O'Reilly's, she entered the cabin and locked the thick wooden door behind her. Her quarters were small but functional. A portal opened to allow fresh air and was situated above a sizable cot bolted to the wall. A small wet metal wash pan was secured behind a stool that was fastened to the floor opposite the bed. The lamp attached near the bunk was full of oil with a fold of matches tucked in between the base and the luminary. On the bed lay a heavy clay wash jar. Under the bunk she spied a covered white porcelain chamber pot and a small wooden chest with towels and cloths. These items had probably been placed there by the captain, especially for her. Mary blushed at the thought. How things had changed for her in the last couple of weeks, her life going from routine, repetitive tasks to something almost undescribable every single day. She was as much scared as nervous of her new surroundings and planned to stay put uh, her, as her previous hostess has suggested. In a few days, she would be with her sisters. She just had to stick it out and be brave for that long. Dana would keep her as safe as possible, but she also had to do her part so as not to put him in a tough situation. 
Cheers, everybody. Merton, can I speak to you, please? He was down. She turned the key and opened the door to allow him in. He took a quick look around and told her to try to try and rest. He would bring her a bite to eat when the cook had prepared breakfast and they had left port. He figured it wouldn't be long. Mary locked the door behind him. Soon she could feel the vessel move beneath her. The slight rocking motion tugging at her body indicated they were on their way. The rising sun streamed through the portal when the boat cleared the view of the mountain on the right and turned into the bay. God help her, she was on her way to Boston. She noticed the black cannons on the hill overlooking the port, like watchmen guarding the harbor. Mrs. O'Reilly had spoken of a place called Castle Hill, and she assumed this was it. The guns on the site had saved Placentia from invasion more than once, but that, she supposed, was in less civilized times. Before long, she could hear the churn of the engine and the sound of the wind flickering the sails to attention. Mary lay on the bunk and fell asleep, waiting a while later for Daniel's knock. He carried in a warm plate of beans with pork and a cup of tea. Self-exiled, for the next two days she stayed in the cabin to read. Her only company was an occasional visit from Daniel. The captain spoke of the young lad in the cabin with seasickness so as not to draw unwanted attention to Mary. Daniel reported the next evening that they were outside Halifax and would make Boston in good time. Two more nights aboard the ship and Mary would be with her sisters. The next day, Mary's heart began to pound when she heard raised voices and activity outside her cabin. When the voices moved away, Daniel knocked and announced himself. She unlocked the door to allow him entry. Apparently, some of the men have heard that there was a woman on board and assumed that it was you, he said. But how did they find out I haven't left the room? Daniel told her that Pierce had overheard talking to the guards about a red-haired lad that had, and had, that had shot him and that she was traveling on the ship. A few men came to see for themselves. One fellow notified the captain who headed the others off in the hallway. Daniel said it looked as if the crew knew about her, but the captain now had control of the situation. He threatened to go to the nearest port and replace the men if they so much as breathed in the hallway here by the stairs. Daniel was confident that she was safe. The men seemed more curious than anything. However, Mary could doubt, tell that she might have some doubt, that he might have some doubts. By afternoon, the captain sent Daniel to fetch her and allowed her on deck for the first time since she had boarded. The captain greeted her and introduced her to the mates in the wheelhouse, each one taking off his cap and fixing his hair before extending a handshake. I'm allowing you on deck since my crew now know there is a lady among us, the captain said in an authoritative yet charming voice. I would advise you not to talk to anyone unless accompanied. Mr. Cooper will escort you back to your cabin once you've had a chance at a bit of fresh air and sunlight. She was grateful to get out of her quarters, even for a brief time. The books were exciting, but the monotonous view from the portal was tiring. Nothing but deep blue ocean meeting a lighter blue sky. A tall, slinky young lad interrupted the captain. He said one of the crew had tripped on a line on the bowsprit and fallen to the deck. He believed a man may have a broken arm. The captain cursed loudly and ordered the young man to take him to the injured crewman. The first mate took control of the ship. Do you have a ship's doctor rest down? No, we're to pick one up in that Boston before heading to the banks, the captain said. Is there anything I can do to help? Mary interjected. I'm planning to study to be a doctor, and I have some experience with broken arms from helping my mother. She was a nurse. First, I'll check the man myself. I'll send somebody to fetch you if needed. We try to do our own doctoring unless something's more serious, he said, before 
disappearing around the side of the house along the gunnel uh, to the forecastle. The same lad came back looking sullen. He asked Mary if both she and Daniel would accompany him to the makeshift infirmary in the rear of the boat near the captain's quarters. Several crew had carried the injured fellow there, and the captain was waiting within. Both quickly went below. Upon entering the narrow room, they heard a commotion. A young man lay on a board that straddled two crates, howling in pain. The captain let Mary through. She came around the makeshift table, assessing the man's condition, and every instinct driving her to know just what to do. The bone in his lower arm was pushing on the skin, but hadn't come through yet. She took this to be a good sign. We don't have to write skills for this, the captain said. Are you sure she knows a thing or two about doctor and the captain looked at them? Having a woman on board is one thing, but letting her tend to the injury is another. Daniel pulled the coat up his shoulder and showed the captain his scar. She showed me up and saved my life. She can do this. I need some spirits, Mary said. If he could have a few swallows for the pain, it would make it easier. The captain examined Daniel's arm and nodded to one of the men who produced a bottle of rum. Mary gave the boy a few swallows. What's your name, young man, she said. It's Tommy, miss, Tommy Duke. Well, Tommy, you have a couple more swallows of that stuff, and I'll put you on the path for mending, she reassured him. Yes, miss, he said, taking two more large gulps. Mary looked at the captain. I need a stick or, or something for him to bite on. A short, bearded man pushed a small piece of partially whittled driftwood forward. Mary asked Tommy to open wide and bite down on the stick. He smiled and complied. His pain seemed to have abated. She asked four men to hold down his legs, Daniel and Captain Ferguson to hold down his shoulders, and she was ready. Now, Tommy, I'm going to have to set your arm back in place, Mary said. It's going to hurt for about a minute. Then you'll be able to sleep, and your arm will heal properly. Now, does that sit well with you? He nodded, his teeth clenching the wood. She noticed her, his eyes were glassing over from the alcohol. She called for a stool and perched on the seat, strategically placing her feet on the crate below Tommy's arm. She told him she'd count to three and pull his arm back in place. On two, Mary pulled with all her might and watched as the bone slid toward her and then back beneath the skin in the proper alignment. Tommy screamed and tried to get free, but the men held him fast. Within seconds, he went quiet and still, and Mary patted his forehead. There now, all done, she said, smiling at the young man on the board. I just need to splint it. You'll have to use your other arm for the next few weeks. Tommy attempted to smile and then passed out. He'll be fine, she told the captain.